Okay, so I kind of have the leftovers in some <laughs> sense, and there's a lot of things that can cause it, and there is some overlap with Ren what Renee talked about, but we'll kind of touch on a few more things. So, you know, we talked about the emboli causing it and GCA. Um, in terms of hemodynamic causes, you can kind of think of it as reduced perfusion to the retina, and so there's a few things that can kind of fall under that category, including hypotension, high blood viscosity, hypertension, and then just in general reduced ocular perfusion for other things, and we'll talk about that. Kind of other vascular, other than the emboli and vasculitis, if, um, fistula is causing like steel from the retinal circulation, vasospasms. And then um, I guess migraine shouldn't be there. This is kind of like optic disc, brain, kind of other optic uh, tract stuff. Migraine, optic disc edema, optic disc anomalies, gaze evoked amaurosis. We'll talk more about that. And then there's kind of these miscellaneous ocular causes. So Renee did touch on this, but just to kind of try to differentiate things, um, for retinal vascular insufficiency or hypoperfusion, the symptoms in general are longer, so not in the seconds to minutes range, less rapid onset. Um, the vision loss is maybe more patchy, less distinct, but they can still describe it, and positional, and usually a lot of times people will describe kind of a peripheral constriction of their visual field. And again, I think we all know from being in clinic and being on call, these are only general guidelines and anything is possible, which is the scary part of it all. So um, for retinal vascular insufficiency, high blood viscosity can cause reduced blood flow. Just as an example, you know, reports of people with polycythemia vera, um, about 10% of those patients can complain of just transient monocular vision loss. Um, with reduced ocular perfusion, systemic hypotension could potentially cause it. I mean, it's a little rare and not kind of the classic presentation to be monocular, but in theory, if there's a drop in systemic blood pressure and some asymmetry of the anterior circulation and stenosis on one side more than the other, you could get this unilateral presentation. Um, anything with low cardiac output, which could include, you know, arrhythmias, um, is definitely a cause. And then carotid artery occlusion, not only you can have the emboli, but just not enough blood flow. And so you can get these situations where you're not getting enough blood flow, and then there's stressors to the whole system that cause the vision loss too. So again, history is just really important to try to see if you can get any other clues to what's bringing this on, what makes it worse. So light-induced transient vision loss or amaurosis is um, you know, you're not getting enough blood flow, and the thought is that the light and having that much stimuli in the retinal system is kind of putting it into a higher metabolic state that it just cannot keep up with the demand. And so people will have these episodes where they say, you know, in the bright light or these situations is when I notice it. There are some reports, I mean, not this is not super common, but just kind of interesting that you know, postprandial, same kind of deal that you, your body is putting all its energy into your digestive system in theory and causing this transient vision loss. Reports of exercise-induced transient vision loss, which could be from, you know, um, hypoperfusion. It could also be Utah's phenomenon if you're raising your um, body temperature. Just to reiterate, carotid dissection. Um, if you ha think, you know, definitely painful of lateral vision loss, and especially if there's anything else, like if you see any sign of corners or anything kind of leaning you towards that, definitely something to keep on the differential. With chronic ocular hypoperfusion, um, this can be more, I mean, it's still transient, but it can be a little bit longer, like into the hours time frame, and some reports of positive visual phenomenon you know, again, you can read all these reports, and there's always exceptions to the rules, but you can just kind of just categorize it. Julie, yeah. What's a painful uh -huh. vision loss with the carotid dissection? Is it the actual eye? Well, like Eileen's patient, headache, anything, headache. Okay. anything that's it's not like Eileen's patient. Right, right. exactly like that. So I mean, I think that's a good tip off that this isn't. You know, it kind of puts it in another category that we need to be a little bit more worried about. And I don't know on him if he had any, it sounds like he didn't have anything else on exam, but any ptosis, any pupil abnormalities, but 
yeah, painful, including just the whole. <laughs> so um, again, under this category of just vascular insufficiency, if you have venous hypertension, which could also be from if you have really high intraocular pressure causing this, can do that. Um, extracerebral steel, so AV malformations that cause the blood to be kind of shunted away, anemia. Um, so I think Renee touched on this, but either central retinal artery occlusion, impending or partial, or impending central retinal vein occlusions um, can kind of present as this transient vision loss. And so again, it's something you really need to keep on your differential. And if you see any kind of asymmetry in the vasculature or just you know something that kind of tips you off that needs to be something you can get an FA for but keep in the back of your mind there were reports with central uh, you know a few case series with central retinal artery Im occlusion like impending occlusions that they more commonly had these like negative visual phenomenon again not always the case but um, you know it's kind of a scary thing so we have to take these seriously so I think Renee talked a little bit about it, but we really just, you want to look for anything that can help you figure out what category to put these in. So on the fundus exam, venous distension, anything that's kind of showing venous stasis, retinopathy, blot hemorrhages, and then think about, you know, the, look at the whole eye. If you have any signs of anterior segment ischemia, you know, that can tip you off to a, um, ocular ischemic syndrome and kind of just help you differentiate these things. Okay, so <laughs> we've mentioned these vasospasms before and this is kind of a, a difficult area. So it's uh, symptom-wise can last 15 to 30 minutes, so kind of in this mid-range. Usually it's gradual, associated with positive visual phenomenon, but it can be really severe and you can have complete vision loss. Um, you, you need to make this diagnosis as a diagnosis of exclusion, um, and it can be associated, kind of associated with the migraine. It's this gray area, but um, there's reports of Raynaud syndrome where you don't have any systemic um, I think, I mean, really rarely having any systemic signs and then having these vasospasms. But basically, if you're making the diagnosis as a primary vasospasm, you need to have excluded all the scary things that we've talked about, and there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the retinal, and just kind of to put this, to kind of give us a little bit of um, uh, background, retinal migraine classification which kind of falls into the vasospasm category or there's some overlap between the two. They need to have two episodes of transient monocular visual loss associated with or followed by a headache with migranous features. Um, but that leaves so much room. It, you know, it's just, I guess the point of this is it's so nebulous and that really could be a lot of other things too. So we just need to be really careful. So this is an interesting case report I found. Um, there was a 33-year-old lady and she had, had been having these episodes of like about 10 minutes of complete NLP vision loss in her right eye. And she happened to be in a clinic, I think it was a neurology clinic, and she started having one and they emergently wheeled her over to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic and we're able to get some really interesting photos. So on her exam, she was NLP, she had a right APD, and this was just the fundus photos, and you can see there's venous box carring, showing venous stasis, or sorry, arterial uh, box carring. And um, then they did an FA, and so she had this really delayed arterial filling, but had normal choroidal blush, and kind of is a really good example of this you know, um, central retinal artery having poor perfusion with normal perfusion of the ophthalmic artery. When the episode resolved, she, you know, they repeated everything, everything went back to normal. In her, they kind of diagnosed it as a vasospasm related to migraine. And, but again, it, it kind of, it's a scary thing and it's hard to <laughs> be okay with that diagnosis without doing a big workup. But it's just to show you if you catch these things, I mean, there's real pathology going on and real changes. 
This is another case of just a vasospasm that was caught um, over 40 minutes. And so you can see the actual changes you know, over time of the vasospasm and decreased blood flow and then the resolution. So of course, if you see that on exam, then you, have, you can feel comfortable about making that diagnosis, but we don't catch people very often. <laughs> But the other thing that is scary is that you can have secondary vasospasm from any of these causes. So vasospasm isn't a clean diagnosis, and all of these things are still on your differential, even if you think it's just a vasospasm. So keep all of that in mind. And then kind of our next category is optic nerve disease causing vision loss. So Papilledema, I think we're all fairly familiar with transient visual obscuration. So those are more in the few seconds to minutes range, smaller or you know shorter, usually bilateral, positional, um, and then of course thinking about other signs of increased um, intracranial pressure. We have to go through that diagnosis. AION, either NAION or arteritic, you know, or GCA and arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and Eileen had touched on that. Um, with both anomalous discs and optic disc drusen, just the architecture of the discs and the anatomy, um, it can basically pinch off its own ciliary blood supply, or even the ciliary or the central retinal artery can have decreased blood flow, and so they can get these episodes of vision loss that can last for seconds. They can have them frequently. They can be provoked by changing gaze or changing positions. And then with um, optic nerve compression from, you know, if you have a orbital mass, you can get transient monocular vision loss as well. And that's basically the same idea that you're moving the eye and that mass is changing the blood flow and causing this decreased blood flow and then the, the transient vision loss. So again, history of when, what aggravates it, when do you notice it, all these are just so important to try to help us narrow down what we're looking at because obviously anything <laughs> can cause, I mean, a huge amount, a huge differential. And then Utah's phenomenon, um, Renee touched on, but again, it's a demyelinating, in a demyelinating disease when you raise your um, body temperature, it causes nerve conduction, slowing and loss, and you can get vision loss from that. And then just, again, miscellaneous, or I guess these should, I don't know, I guess we could call it ocular. Dry eyes, super common. Keratoconus, hyphema, vitreous hemorrhage like Eileen talked about. And intermittent angle closure glaucoma is definitely another one that we really have to think about. And there are a lot of, or there's reports, that, you know, you don't have to have pain with these episodes. And so we, it, it's something that we can see on exam and clues that we can look for on exam. So keep that in the back of your mind too. a bonus because apparently Renee had the same question. <laughs> so you guys probably get that. on the same thing. So. <laughs> yeah, so for number one, what do you guys think? Yes. Number two? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that it, all of these things are obviously, but in terms of permanent visual loss, it's a tip off and need to do that. They all are really important. I mean, and if you guys disagree, that's fine too. If you hear a movie, you've got some of the TMV. I guess I would say both of those would be 
would be an equal. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Well, I, I, if you're trying to rank in the most, yeah. the current vision loss, I mean, if you're trying to prevent a stroke, you know, then right. probably, the carotid root is probably more important, but this, the permanent vision we loss. We only care about the eyes. Eyes. <laughs> well, I, well, well written. Well written. Well written. <laughs> And then this one, yeah, so Eileen's patient, but she didn't, he didn't have the clues. Any questions or other things? 